840, joining us now, retired Colonel Lee Ellis. Love to have him on our show. By the way, Colonel, had a chance to um, read your book for the second time. Now, normally, you read a book. So I did. I read yours because you were coming on the show. I had to get up to speed. But then, this weekend, I read the book again. And it's really, it's a fine piece. It's a, it, it's, I got to recommend it to everybody. It's a great piece of work. But uh, look, we really want to thank you, sir, for being on with us. Well, good morning, John. Good to be with you again. Now, uh, Colonel, I want to get into the Iraqi situation deteriorating as it is. President Obama on Friday says that he's not going to rule any options out except troops on the ground. Monday, he sends troops on the ground. I don't know what he's going to do today. Now he says, well, maybe they're going to send Marines in there, but not to do combat. Maybe to just be advisors looking over their shoulders. Well, Colonel Ellis, we've spent trillions of dollars on advisors and beefing up the Iraqi security team, the Army, if you will. That's failed. Why would another 500 Marines matter? I think that thing the president's concerned about right now is protecting our embassy and our american lives of our contractors there you know he's just made a, a pretty big statement about you know, leaving no one behind americans behind and uh, we do have quite a number behind there in iraq that are in danger so i think that's what he's looking at and probably just not thinking ahead when he, he's trying to say no boots on the ground like we're not going to go fight a war there but in reality, as a president of the United States, he does have a responsibility to take care of these folks there. And I think that's what he's having to come face-to-face with here on Monday morning. What do you think the, uh, the proper action for us is there now? I mean, Baghdad uh, is reeling. The Maliki government is a complete disaster. We've spent so much money in there, so many lives, so many w- wounded Americans so many people maimed, so many people home with psychological disorders. You know, now we're looking at getting resucked in. Why not just get our people out of the embassies, get all of our people out and go home? Well, that's certainly one of the opportun- one of the possibilities that we we have to evaluate. I'm not sure that's the right answer. It may be. Uh, I maybe don't have enough information to make that decision, but I think that the idea of having an al-Qaeda-type state in that location and in that part of the world is pretty scary. Uh, on the other hand, you know, they might have to have some responsibility, I guess, if they had a state rather than hiding out and being terrorists. So it's just hard to say what the, you know, predict what the outcome could be. The thing that I would like to for us to all to think back about is that we're in a situation right now where we don't have really many good choices. And sometimes it's good to take back that up and look. We did have some choices back a few years ago with a status of forces agreement. I think we'd been much better off if we had uh, kept troops there, work, worked through that with the Iraqis so that we had troops there and had a real presence there as we have in other wars after the wars are over. So it's like we pulled out, I think, a little bit too prematurely. Common Sense News, I'm a. 45 here on the John Frederick Show, Washington, D.C., Southern Maryland, Cross Virginia. We're with retired Colonel Lee Ellis. He's also the author of a must-read. It's called Leading with Honor, Leading with Honor, Leadership Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton. And uh, Colonel Ellis has been on the show several times. You know that uh, he spent his share of time in the Hanoi Hilton as a Viet Cong prisoner of war with uh, now Senator John McCain. Uh, Colonel Ellis, looking at the situation right now, protecting our embassy, we certainly don't want to get in the situation we were with, uh, in Benghazi, uh, but there's just a lot of concern right now about getting involved with the further involved in this, uh, conflict. And, and now we're asking the Iranians basically to come in. So it's tough to figure out who our allies were. Look, your friend and mine, John McCain, four months ago, was going bananas. He was going absolutely crazy, saying that we should send uh, troops into Syria to fight on the side of the same people that are now going to overrun the Maliki government. It's tough for the average 
person on the street to make sense out of what this country's foreign policy is. You're exactly right. I'm, it's, it's so complex and it's so changing, ever changing. Well, maybe the characters haven't changed, but the locations have changed. And for us people on the street, it's hard to keep up with who's who here, especially in Syria. I've had a problem keeping up with them myself because I, I have other work to do other than just uh, sit down and or follow foreign policy and the news of Syria. But it is difficult to keep up with. And in some, to some way, we have to trust that you know, our leadership knows what's going on. But when you mention foreign policy, I think it's it's been difficult for all Americans to see what our foreign policy is uh, in recent years. And I think that complicates it for the politicians. It complicates it for the military. It complicates it for the world scene. Uh, our allies don't aren't sure what our foreign policy is either. It's a scary situation, and I think that's it. And, you know, when you get the president, he goes in the Rose Garden on Friday, and he says, I'm going to uh, keep every option open, but I'm not going to send in troops. I mean, why would you even say that? I mean, it, it, it wouldn't, shouldn't the president say all options are open, even if he isn't going to send troops in? I mean, you immediately tip your hand to the enemy. How does that make any sense? Well, that was my first thought, is why would you say anything like that? Because uh, that nobody needs to know that. There's no advantage, other than politically maybe, for some uh, constituencies to be able to say uh, there's not going to be any boots on the ground. We're not going to go back to another war, I think is what he's trying to say. I think Americans uh, would trust him uh, about that right now because uh, they, they don't figure he's probably one to do that right now. So I don't think it was necessary to say that. I think it would probably have been better, as you said, to say all options are on the table. You don't want your enemy, you don't want to tip your hand to your enemy and uh, let them know exactly what you're going to do or not do. You want to keep them guessing. You want them to think that the worst thing can happen to them in the, mil- in the military and when you're dealing with these kinds of situations. You know, it's about power and fear and all those kind of things that come to play. You want your enemy to fear you. You want them to see your power and you want them to back down and not fight so you don't have to fight. So. I think tipping your hand too much is uh, is has been a problem for us uh, quite a quite a bit in the recent years. What do you make of the foreign policy leadership of this uh, president from his administration on down? Susan Rice, a security advisor, uh, John Kerry, Secretary of State, Chuck Hagel, Department of Defense. I mean, you've been through a lot of these. Well, you got to go all the way back, basically, to. Uh, President uh, Johnson, what do you make of th- this administration and their foreign policy? How do you rate it, sir? Well, now that you've mentioned it, going all the way back, I think the leaders get in trouble in foreign policy when they start making foreign policy decisions more on internal politics than foreign policy, what's best for the United States and our security in the days ahead. So I think that would be uh, one of the questions I would ask is how much has internal politics impacted foreign policy? And it it seems to always have done that with most every administration, some less than others. Uh, I think as a leader, as a statesperson, statesman, stateswoman, whatever, I think it's important in foreign policy to think strategically for the best interest of the United States, develop a policy that looks like it can be carried out for the next 10 to 20 years and then follow that policy, making adjustments as you go along. But when you start making foreign policy decisions based on what's politically uh, expedient at the moment internally, uh, it, you get into a zigzag type of foreign policy that is not... Uh, you know, in Vietnam, we didn't pursue the war aggressively as we should have early in the war. Once we were in, you know, I was reading this morning about the Gulf of Tonkin. Mm-hmm. I, re- I was reading Commander Ever- Everett Alvarez's article in the USO magazine this month, and he was talking about they really never saw any ships at the uh, in the uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident that started that war. So there's just always, we always get this, uh, what is the leader want to do and how does he looking at it from an internal political perspective and i think that overrides way too much common sense news time 850 this is the john frederick show washington dc across virginia we're with retired air force colonel lee ellis colonel ellis spelt spent 
uh, a period of time, five and a half years in a uh, Hanoi and the one of the Hanoi Hiltons as a prisoner of war of the Viet Cong has a must read workout. I've read this two times because the first time I, I, it, w- it was enjoyable, but then the second time I was like, I really got to uh, start getting out my highlighter stuff. Uh, leading with honor. You can get leading with honor at Amazon or have your favorite p- p- bookstore. Leading with honor by Colonel Lee Ellis. The voice of Virginia is on your radio dial. Here he is, John Fredericks. Welcome back. Yeah, you're back, 853, John Frederick Show. Great to have you. Got to read this. Leading with honor by uh, Colonel Lee Ellis, retired from the Air Force. Uh, Colonel Lee Ellis spending five and a half years at Hanoi Hilton, prisoner of the Viet Cong, served there with Senator John McCain. I'm telling you, this is a must-read. You pick it up, you're not going to be able to put it down. Leading with honor. You can go to Amazon or any of your favorite bookstores and get it right there. Uh, Colonel Ellis, I want to get to the Bo Bergdahl situation. Um, if anybody understands, uh, doing a trade, getting out of a prison as a POW, it's Colonel Lee Ellis. What did you make of that? Well, it's, it's been a little bit puzzling all along. I certainly am happy and excited that Bo Bugdarl is out and released. I know his family is, and it's just, it's good to have him out. On the other hand, the situation, uh, in which, you know, five terrorists were traded, kind of spoils that whole thing because we have a policy of not negotiating with terrorists. It uh, sets a real bad example, and we think that uh, our enemies are already thinking about how they can grab one an American here or there and negotiate for the rest of those terrorists that we're holding. Uh, it also raises questions about presidential overreach, as uh, we've heard from both sides of the aisle, that uh, he violated the 30-day uh, no you know, removal from Guantanamo, right. Guantanamo notification that was needed. So just a number of issues going on around that that just raised concerns about what the motivation for that swap was. Uh, was it to say the war is over? Uh, was it to empty out Guantanamo? What was the real motivation for that? It seems like it was more than just getting Birdall out of there. So you thought there were, uh, like you said earlier, Colonel Ellis, uh, that there were political, there were political implications that went into the president's decision. Yeah, I guess that's always the way it is. Uh, it seems like there were, you know, internal political. Maybe it was about his legacy. Maybe it's about certain uh, constituencies that he's concerned about. I don't know. I have no idea what his motivation was. But when you look at it, it just it's not to go with counsel not to seek counsel, not to make that a uh, a decision that's carefully thought through. Whenever leaders make uh, kind of arbitrary decisions on their own, it always uh, makes it look uh, questionable. And I think there was just a process to be followed here, and it wasn't followed, and that just always concerns me. In your evaluation in this particular incident, did President Obama violate the law? Well, I'm not a lawyer, and I haven't read the details of it, but it seems as though he probably did, considering that uh, people on both sides of the aisle have indicated that he did not follow the law that he actually signed. So uh, it, it seems like he might have not followed the law. I think uh, people who manage and look after those things, I think the Congress has got to deal, dig, dig, dig into that and deal with it uh, because they're – their power is at stake too. Their role is part of our three, you know, three parts of government. Their role is really at stake here. No question. That is going to be the final word. Colonel retired Air Force Colonel Lee Ellis. He's uh, spent uh, time in a Hanoi Hilton as a prisoner of the Viet Cong back in the day. Now out with a new work called Leading with Honor. Leading with Honor, just go to Amazon.com or your favorite bookstore. You want to get Leading with Honor by retired Colonel Lee Ellis. Always great to have you on. Colonel, thank you for your long service to the United States, sir. Thank you. Thank you, John. Have a good morning.